So our final scripture reading is going to come from the first letter of the Corinthians. Let me get everything set up here for that. <laughs> um, and it'll come from chapter 9. Uh, verses 19 through 27. And this is one of those scriptures where the more throughout the week I started to read it and prepare for it, the more excited I got. There's some really good stuff in here. And sadly, we won't get to all of it this week. But if you ever want to ask about it, let me know. Um, this is a really good letter from Paul. So let's open our hearts to what the Spirit is saying through the scripture. Paul writes, For though I am free with respect to all, I have made myself a slave to all so that I might gain all the more. To the Jews, I became as a Jew in order to gain Jews. To those under the law, I became as one under the law, though I myself am not under the law, so that I might gain those under the law. To those outside the law, I became as one outside the law, though I am not outside God's law, but am within Christ's law, so that I might gain those outside the law. To the weak, I became weak, so that I might gain the weak. I have become all things to all people, that I might by all means save some. I do it all for the sake of the gospel, so that I might become a partner in it. Do you not know that in a race the runners all compete, but only one receives the prize? Run in such a way that you may win it. Athletes exercise self-control in all things. They do it to receive a perishable wreath, but we receive an imperishable one. So I do not run aimlessly, nor do I box as though beating the air, but I punish my body and enslave it, so that after proclaiming to others, I myself should not be disqualified. This is the word of God for the people of God, and we can say, thanks be to God. Would you pray with me? God, call us to those places where you are already present to the places where Jesus sat with the sick, the hurting, the destitute, and the oppressed, to be Christ among them. Call us to those places, and by this word, inspire in us a life that reflects your grace and love. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So as we continue our series on why be United Methodist or why be UMC, I wonder if you all, some of you lifelong Methodists, longer than I have been a Methodist, some of you new to the Methodist faith, have noticed our Methodist obsession. It's printed on buildings. We read this obsession in seminary classrooms, organizations and schools and hospitals all bear this obsession's name. And I even had to mention him briefly last week. I wonder how many of you have heard of this obsession, this obsession being John Wesley. Has anyone ever heard the name John Wesley before? Hopefully so, or else I, I might need to rethink uh, my ordination. I imagine you can't be Methodist for too long without hearing his name, and I'm not sure there are many denominations that are as infatuated with their founder as Methodists are with John Wesley. Maybe Lutherans, seeking that they, they, they are rooted in Martin Luther, maybe Lutherans, which is funny because John Wesley did not set out as, a, as the pastor he was to start a new denomination. In fact, John Wesley never left the Anglican Church. He never transferred his membership to the Methodist church. John Wesley, the father of Methodism, died an Anglican priest committed to being part of the Anglican denomination, the Church of England. Whoops. So what John Wesley did try to do, much like Martin Luther, much like the Apostle Paul, and even much like Jesus, was revive a stagnant and, and dying Church of England through a life of devotion. And he practiced what we call practical theology. Now, practical theology is a term we use for people like John Wesley, who are not interested in writing these convoluted treatises 
on the nature of God that, that dive deep and use all these big words. John Wesley wrote his theology, not, not to be read in the halls of seminaries, though they are and they hold up that way, but he wrote in order to build up a church and to help connect everyday people with the life of Jesus. He wanted theology to be deeply practical, deeply applicable to people's daily lives. And this is extremely surprising because John Wesley was an Oxford man. His father was an Anglican priest. His brother wrote some of the richest hymns with this beautiful poetry. And yet John Wesley was interested in practical theology. How do we make this matter to people in their everyday lives? I got to pause for a second because I am one of the boneheads who loves those convoluted, intricate theological works. I love reading the likes of Jürgen Moltmann or James Cohn or Catherine Tanner, this, the sort of books that put my classmates to sleep. I, I did, our seminary gave out awards at the end of, of, of your, of your, um, of your, at graduation. I did not get the award for my love of Wesley's theology, which is an award they do give out. Uh, John Wesley is not my favorite. In fact, as I approach ordination, I'm having to reread his sermons again, just so I can sound like a Methodist pastor when I write my paperwork. John Wesley, as great as he was, maybe isn't even one of my top five favorite theologians, but there was something brilliant about what he did, even if he chose not to boast about his brilliance that John Wesley was committed most of his ministry to reawakening, reawakening Christian faith for people who would never step foot in a place like Oxford, or for people who might not even step foot in the sanctums of the cathedrals of these Church of England spaces where he was from. Despite his Christian upbringing and this biblical scholarship, Wesley was very consumed with a very personal question, and so consumed that he felt like it had to be shared with people who would share this worry. His question was, how do I know that I have a redemptive relationship with God? How do I know that I'm saved? How do I know that I'm in the right space? What does a life that is redeemed look like? And for John Wesley, the answer was not found in study, though he did plenty of deep theological study. It wasn't found in visiting hallowed places of his day, though I'm sure he spent time in, in the cathedrals surrounding, uh, in and around England. He found that the assurance that he was looking for, the assurance that led him to love of God and love of neighbor was found in community, showing up in the daily lives of normal folks who were just trying to get by. Wesley famously called, he said, he quoted, he's quoted saying, the world is my parish. And this was indicative because Wesley would often get in trouble for preaching in fields or along roadways or in these public areas, choosing to be among the people who walked past him rather than in a pulpit in a church building. But more central to Wesley's ministry than preaching were these things called societies that he formed and participated in. In fact, it started when he was at Oxford, he joined a holy club which sounds like the last thing you might want to join when you're in college, but he joined this holiness club with other Christians where they would read scripture together and pray together daily, and they would do acts of service together. In fact, Wesley's Oxford Holy Club would go visit people who were imprisoned or feed people who were hungry. Excuse me. John Wesley's faith came alive in this society as these young men who were going through school spent time each day committing themselves to seeking God in each and every moment, committing themselves to being as loving as they could be, to following Jesus' example as closely as they could. John Wesley wasn't saved by necessarily a sermon, though I'm sure he could point to sermons that mattered to him. He felt his Aldersgate experience in a society many years after Oxford where he felt the spirit of God warming his heart and reminding him that he too was loved of God, that he too was a child of God. He felt that in a meeting with normal people just trying to get by. And so eventually he would start this movement of holiness societies in, the, in England, but also in the colonies. He started in Savannah, Georgia and came back. That's a whole nother story. Throughout what was the British Empire at that point, or parts of the British Empire. 
Wesley was not concerned with filling the halls of England's cathedrals. He was more committed to sharing life-giving faith with people who were working class and who were humble who surrounded them. So instead of holding tightly to faith as he had known it growing up, John Wesley and hosts of other Methodists committed themselves to forming a church that meant being together in homes. Churches that often would go a month without seeing a pastor because the pastor would circuit ride around to different places. A church that was built on normal, everyday folk. Churches that would meet in tents and fields. Washington Grove up the road from us used to be a tent revival place back in the early 1900s and the 1800s. Places where we could invite people into life-giving relationship with God, not by study, but by just doing life together. And Paul is advocating for a similar ministry here in Corinthians. You see, Corinth was this major metropolis, you could say it, in the Roman Empire. They didn't have metropolises like we do, but it was a very bustling city. It was filled with wealthy and elite people, and it was filled with people who were impoverished, even people who were debt enslaved to other people. And Paul comes to this city of Corinth, and he's writing this letter, and he doesn't simply reach out to people who have power, to people who, who are learned. He doesn't at, ask the church to meet with him where he is at. Instead, Paul says, I have become weak for the weak. I hope you noticed in that reading that Paul said, I have become like a Jewish person for the Jewish people. I have become like a Gentile for the Gentile. But Paul says quite directly, I have become weak for the weak. And then he goes on to say, I have become all things for all people so that they might receive life-giving faith. Paul didn't just post up in the temple and wait for people to come to him, though he did visit temples, both Greek and the Jewish temple in Jerusalem. Paul formed these communities and houses so that all could participate. In fact, Paul's greatest critique in the letter of the Corinthians is to the powerful and the elite who are not making room, who are not making it easier for the impoverished to be full members united with them. Paul's greatest critique is when we choose to hold ourselves up in one space rather than go out and meet people where they're at in Corinthians, specifically those who are impoverished, those who are struggling to get by. So Paul and John Wesley share this commitment that if we're going to be the church, we have to be a church that is not stuck in the building, but that is meeting people where they are, that, that God is present, not just in the hallowed halls of worship, but in everyday life. And that's where we should be as well. And then Paul says this very odd quotable thing, that Paul is running the race of faith as an athlete trains for competition. Now, Paul's writing this again in Corinth, and in Corinth, there is something called the Isthmian Games. It's kind of like the Olympics. Every two years, athletes from around the Roman Empire would come and compete in these games. And Paul doesn't know about team sports at the time. Most, most sports are individual sports, like you know running and jumping and discus throwing and things like that. But I wonder if Paul could have thought also about being on a team sport, the way that a team has to condition together so that everyone can do their job, the way that a team trains together and works together to build this, this beautiful team that they're trying to compete with. And Paul compares the life of faith to that. And when Wesley was starting these societies, what they were doing was meeting every day to ask each other, how is it? with you and Jesus? How are you growing in your faith? And they were training their spirits in the same way that an athlete would train. Now, I'm not someone who's well-versed in the gym. I try to exercise, but I tend to be the one who goes for a little bit and then stops and then goes for a little bit and stops. And what ends up happening is I get in more pain in the long run because my muscles aren't used to that sort of work and rhythm. And so I'll go in and I'll work really hard for a couple of days and then I'll take a couple months off because, you know, those couple of days make up for the couple of months I've been taking off. Even when I go hiking, I do these large spurts of hiking. I maybe I'm not the one who's doing the five milers two times a week to try to keep in hiking shape. And then I regret it after I go do 10 miles or something. But I think what's interesting is that what Wesley started. What Wesley wanted was a church that met people where they were so that daily they could train their spirits to be closer to the love of Christ, 
to ask the hard questions, but to do so in a way that was approachable and welcoming. And so the thing that I love about our Methodist church, one of the reasons I moved from the Presbyterian church to the Methodist church was that we have this longstanding tradition of knowing that church doesn't just happen once a week, but can happen every day amongst people who are just trying to get it right together. That we come from this tradition where it's important that we sit down together and share space together and hold each other accountable to trying to follow Jesus more closely, but also get, gather to share the grace of Christ. Throughout our history, that has been when we've been strongest, is when we focus on meeting people where they are, sharing grace where people are, and training ourselves to get closer to Christ each and every day. Not just going in short spurts, but each day seeking out Jesus. And what's so funny is I find this to be not just a model of ministry from Paul, but a model of ministry from Jesus who meets the lepers who are outcasts where they're at and consistently does that, who meets the tax collectors where they're at and consistently does that, that Wesley in trying to revive the Anglican church was really just trying to go back to the model of ministry of finding Jesus. Jesus, who only spends a small amount of his ministry in the temple in Jerusalem. Jesus, who spends much more time in the fields, calling people to live as best they can, but also reminding people of grace. And so I wonder if, as we continue to stress about how the church can grow, how the church can continue to affect people's lives positively, if we too might assume the tradition that we come from, not just the Methodist tradition, but the Jesus tradition of meeting people where they're at of building relationship with them, of doing worship outside the building in the houses of our friends, and calling each of us to seek Jesus a little more each day, to discipline ourselves in this spiritual way so that we might continue to strengthen our conviction and love of Jesus. This is part of our tradition as Methodists, but this is also the calling Christ has when he tells his disciples to go, not just stay but go and make disciples of all nations. Would you pray with me? So God, we are all normal people. All of us is someone who is struggling or seeking to know you better. And just as you spoke through those who came before us, not in these big theological ideas, but in the daily seeking of you, just as you speak to and for all people, call us to those spaces where we can share your love. Call us to those spaces where we can build relationships of care and compassion. And call us to daily train ourselves to seek you. So God, send us Strengthen us and then send us out into the world to share your grace that is free for all. In Jesus' name, amen.